This is Frances Scan on behalf of Strath Neighbour Museum interviewing Alan Mackay, 139 Skinnet, who's a shepherd and farm manager in Nemes. Rath Todek, um, could you tell me something about the settlement's connections to your family? Well, uh, my great great grandmother was evicted from here at the time of Highland Clearances. They were forcibly moved out and they resettled at Achnahuag in Melness. The houses are typical style, what they would call black houses. The walls went up to probably not much higher than the person themselves, probably a bit lower, maybe just shoulder height. The roof trusses were made mostly from peat bog, far that's the stuff that comes out of the ground that's found when you're cutting peats. It's old trees that have died back from years and years ago. They are a very important part of the house structure because there is no trees in this area for building. So when they were cleared, they required these timbers to rebuild where they were going. And in a lot of the cases, the houses were burnt out and they didn't have these timbers to rebuild their houses. It would then be clad in possibly turfs. In many cases, it was thatched with heather and the fire would probably be in the middle of the house. It may have been at the end, but more likely in the middle of the house, and open the top. And that was typical black houses. There were also, the animals lived in the house, but not in the same part of the house as the people lived. They were brought in in the winter time into the, the, the few cattle they would have would be taken in. Now that would add to the warmth of the house as well. But they were in a separate part of the house. They weren't just wandering around in the house with the people as some think it was separate and the house that we're, we're at, you, there is a definite divide between them uh, and this area there would have been probably three houses of the same here. You'll find the boundary walls of the area that they worked, they would have been growing potatoes, bare type barley and then they graze the hill in the summer way out onto shealings, they put their cattle and their sheep out there. Their cattle would have been descendants of the highland cattle we have today. They would be smaller, they would probably be quite a hairy type of animal. Black, brindled coloured, which is a sort of black, red colour. They would have had some form of sheep, probably more Hebridean type, that would maybe be goats. And no doubt there was hens about the place as well. On this particular area here, they also had the Kyle of Tongue to live off. So they had shellfish. They would most definitely have been getting fish out of the sea as well to add to their diet. So their lifestyle would have been... Productive. Productive lifestyle, mm. yes. yes. Uh, they would have been comfortable in the standards of the time mm -hmm. compared to today, no. But then, yes, they were, they were probably quite content with their lot. The whole of the Kyla Tongue was inhabited then. From the far end you had Achie Moor, then you had the the Airy Veg, and above that there was the Badna Raffin and Unstreppen. Past Totag you have a Borschgag and then you've got Achavuldrach and then you continue up and you went to Melnus where there was settlement there, not as it is today, but there was people living in these places so it carried on, so it was a well populated area. They were cleared to make way for the sheep and they wanted the sheep in the land because the land was good. So to say they were impoverished is a bit of a contradiction. If they were impoverished, why did they want the land? Because the land was good, because it was looked after well, particularly because they were grazed it with cattle and the cattle made the ground fertile. When the sheep farmers came in, they grazed it hard large numbers of sheep, probably more sheep than really should have been on it, which was detrimental in later years, not at the time because it was good grazing. They were interested in profit and that's what they got because at the time it was the Napoleonic Wars, there was a desperate need for meat and wool, so money was good to them, the place was good to the sheep farmers and the people were then evicted off to make way for them and they were impoverished, getting put down to what we have now as Crofts. Crofting 
was imposed on the people. It isn't something that came about. It was imposed on them. And that's the system we have today, which now they are protected because of the clearances the people are protected in their, with their land. It was peat that they would have burnt on the fires. The peat banks are still visible behind the, the houses here. You can see them quite clearly. Those fires would have been burning since possibly Pictish time because people have lived here for that long and it was once the fire was going, it was going for generations. So when the clearances came, that was the end of that. That was an end. The fire went out. For the first time. For the first time in generations. So Alan, did your family stay long in Achnehoeg after they'd been cleared out to the north? Well, my great-grandmother was born in Achnehoeg and my grandfather was born in Achnehoeg. But soon after he was born, a my great-grandmother and my great-grandfather, they moved to Heelam Ferry on Loch Erebo. Uh, my great-grandfather was a boat builder and cabinet maker. He came from down the Free, which is just further down in the illness. And their intention had been to emigrate to Canada, but the Duke of Sutherland persuaded them to go to Heelam Ferry to run the ferry, a passenger ferry, from Heelam Ferry to Port Macon on the west side of Loch Erebo. And they moved there in 1885, 1886 it would be. My grandfather was born in Melmus but literally moved within months of that. And that's where my family stayed until 1990. They were still there. It was a very busy place here on ferry because there was the passenger ferry which ran as I say, it took passengers, it saved them walking all the way around the Kyle. It didn't take any more than a bicycle. And my great-grandmother had a shop there, which sounds kind of funny having a shop there, but you remember that it's a sea, deep sea loch. Trawlers came in there, so she was very busy with boats coming and going. My grandfather, funnily enough, when he went off to university, went to university by trawler because the trawlers were coming in from Aberdeen there, so he went to university by boat. There were seven sons and four of the sons fought in the First World War. The, my grandfather, his two brothers George and Alec and another brother John who was with the Canadian forces, he, all survived, although my grandfather was a, taken prisoner and was missing, presumed dead, and Alec and George both were wounded during the war, but they survived. John survived with the Canadian forces, and not long after the war, he emigrated and lost touch with the family, and we don't know whatever happened to him. At the end of the First World War, Alec was the family member that was keen to do the crofting, which they had a small holding there, and it was promised to the ex-servicemen that Erebo Farm, which you can see just across from Heelam Ferry, was to be broken up for the servicemen, and that promise was never held. It was a broken promise, and the men never got that given to them. It's still, as you see, a large sheep farm, and uh, that's just history. Anson he was the youngest, he was the second youngest a member of the family. The youngest son died in his thirties from a TB. But Anson lived there all his life for a short spell. He did actually work in Glasgow and he was the boatman at Loch Cor. He took up his father's trade, he was a boat builder, but he was also, I would call him an engineer and an inventor. He very much like to challenge himself in making things and had a wind power generator for electricity long before there was ever electricity in any of the places around here. He built that himself and he was continually building and making things. In 1990, my Anson left through ill health to go and live with my father, his nephew and uh, 
the, the lease of the holding was not renewed and the estate took it back in hand and that was the end of the, yeah, that was over a hundred years the family were in there. Down at the Heelham Ferry there was lime kilns. They were closed at about, I think in about the 1840s, they ceased to exist, they stopped working. The lime was actually quarried on the island of the peninsula and it was then put into great big pits and burnt and the lime was then taken out of there and taken by boat to be put onto the land down in the east coast and it also used for building purposes. Uh, I believe it was not a nice place to work at the time. My wife's great grandfather was there as a boy and he said it was just stewer everywhere. It wasn't a nice place. Uh, and but it stopped. Our family was in there after it had ceased to work. Well, ironically, I am the farm manager shepherd for Melness Farm, the very farm that cleared my ancestors off to make way for the sheep. I know I'm a shepherd in the farm. It's a relatively large sheep farm. We carry about a thousand ewes in that and followers. It, at one time, Melness Farm was the largest sheep farm in Europe. It is nowhere near that size now. It was broken down at the time of the Sound Estate selling off and it's now down to a 20 odd thousand acres of hill land. It's an extensive hill sheep farm. Uh, it's changed in a lot of ways. The manpower is not there. A farm that at one time would have had at least five shepherds is now shepherded by myself and another hand, the two of us. We take in contractors to help at busy times. The main things that have changed is the transportation. We have vehicles to get about. We have quad bikes. Animal medicines have changed sheep farming dramatically. We don't get the deaths that we used to get. We still manage the sheep in much the same way on the hill. They're kept on their own ground. They come in at lambing. They go back out again. They come back in to be clipped and they're back out in the hill again. So they spend nine months of their life on that hill, of which part of that is through the winter. They don't come in. They're on the hill for themselves. They have to go on with it. If the weather's bad, we will get supplementary feeding, but other than that, they are left to get on with it. The hill farming and crofting today is very similar to what it would have been a hundred years ago. Crofting has changed in that less people are doing the crofting, less of the land has worked, there's certainly less stock kept. That was the same situation within the hill farms. A conservation has become a major player in these hill farms and crofting. We are having to work hand in hand with conservation measures that are put upon us. Some are good, some we might argue with, but it is the way it is. And because of that, a lot of people are not going to be prepared to put up with the red tape, I think. And it's a very fragile existence. We are very much determined upon the price of lamb we haven't in the position to finish lambs, we have to sell them store, as with the cattle. Our markets are far away. If it wasn't for agricultural support, there would be even less sheep farmers and hill farmers in this area, and crofters in particular, would not be here. They couldn't exist without the agricultural support. There's still huge economic tensions going on here. Yeah. It's, uh, the cost of living in these, this part of the world is not cheap. Transportation is the biggest expense we have for everything. It has to be transported in, it has to be transported out, and fuel prices are not cheap. So that really makes the job very, very difficult economically. One of the largest concerns, the biggest concerns that the agricultural industry in general, but certainly in these, this part of the world is, there is very few young people coming into it. Uh, the farms now, because of the economics, tend to have one shepherd. There is not the same number of under shepherds getting taken on within crofting itself. The, it's a hard 
it's not a hard life, but it's hard work making a living at it. And young, a lot of the young people are not going to be prepared to do it, and in a way you can't blame them. And those that are trying to get into it, finding it increasingly difficult to get a start because a lot of the farms are not taking on young people, but there is less and less young people wanting to do it. 